so really, I think everything, if the gods are with us, should run fairly well. And um, I will consider this the beginning of the lecture. Actually, it's not much of a lecture. It's a combination of things I've done in the past that are uh, illustrative of the kind of material that's behind the genotype diet and somewhat illustrative of my own evolution in terms of how um, I've come across this information, codified it, and tried to put it into a vehicle that the health consumer could use. It's very nice to write uh, complicated scientific treatises, uh, and there's a place for those. Uh, but no publisher is all that interested in them, and rightfully so, because most consumers are, number one, they're so barraged with information that they can't really sort a lot of it out. And I think there's a real reasonable expectation that experts are supposed to do that for them. Experts are supposed to take the complex, and if they're lucky enough to be gifted with a bit of artistry, to take that complex and weave it into something that's metaphorical and lyrical and actually takes it to the point where it becomes an animating principle in a simple way for people who don't have science backgrounds but who want to do something for their health. And that's what I've uh, tried to do with this book. It isn't, it's, it's, it's got a reasonable amount of depth and, and I think one of the things that I've learned in writing the blood type books was I think what, what is successful in a long term diet bookseller. In other words, there's no shortage of, of books on the subject of human nutrition and diet that have a real nice sales curve in the beginning. It's almost like a tsunami. It just comes in, they can't sell them fast enough, and then eight weeks later you look on Amazon and they're 218,000. Because something else has come along which has just taken that place. And so there's, and there's a certain evolution of that thing that really is part and parcel of the diet book industry. But then there's the books that I've written, which continue to this day to sort of just kind of grind along. They just grok it day to day. They sell their copies. My first book is still in hardcovers. And I think that part of the success of the book was not necessarily that it was a diet book, but that somebody could read that book under the covers at night from beginning to end as part of a, an exercise in storytelling, as part of how you might read a, a, a book that you were enjoying uh, from almost a a tactile sense. And in diet books don't often do that. It's mostly how to lose weight, how to get into the tuxedo for your sister's wedding, here's how to do it, here's the diet, and then the second half of the book is, you know, like the first reframe, well here's more of the same. So essentially you just get the second half thrown in, relatively pedantic type prose. And, I, and not that I'm knocking it, I just think that that's a genre. But it's not my genre. My genre is to look at what the mandate was for me as a naturopathic doctor. So automatically I have to tell you that I'm beyond the pale as far as conventional medicine is concerned because naturopaths from the beginning are looked uh, a little bit askance because we have the job of being crazy. That's our, that's our profession. We look at things different, that's what we're supposed to do. I tell the patients, you see that license on the wall? That, that's the license that says I can be out of my mind. I have the legal right to be out of my mind. And by that I mean I don't have to be hamstrung by what I would consider to be uh, reasonable standards of practice. I'm free to investigate every single person as a unique individual. As long as I can keep myself on track with that, everything works fine. It's very hard because it's hard to split people up to make relevant statements about them unless you have some way of doing it. Uh, and it's not easy to come up with ways of doing it. As a, as a student, I was always told, well, treat the patient, not the disease, which is an aphorism in my profession, goes back a long time, uh, except that nobody could tell you how to do that. I would say to the teachers, well, okay, how do we do that? And, well, you know, train them as an individual. Okay, great, but how do I do that? Well, I never seemed to get a good answer. And blood type, in the beginning, became part of the answer. At least it was something that was different. I mean, it was a pretty profound difference. If you took blood from somebody and put it in the wrong person, they die. I mean, this is a pretty profound difference amongst people. You can take, for instance, an arm from an African American, and if you had to, staple it on to somebody who's Asian, and it might survive. They might do well with that. But if you put the wrong blood from somebody who's your sister or your cousin inside of you, you're going to be, you're going to be quite ill. Uh, so blood is a pretty big difference, blood types are a pretty big difference, and it turns out that one of the things people didn't know a lot about blood types was why they were there. The medical model basically said blood types were a, a sort of way to screw up a transfusion, and that's what they, they teach you in medical school. Blood types mess up transfusions. 
And I think that that's kind of a silly way to do it because in essence you're looking at the modern day reason we have a blood type and then saying, well, that's the reason I'm getting an education in this. And the truth is that blood types are there for very deep reasons. They have to do with infectious diseases. They have to do with adaptation to different geographies and climates and different flora and fauna and different ways that you come in contact with foods. And it's all in the literature. You can find probably from about 1966, maybe 13,000 articles referenced on, on Medline on ABO blood types. Probably 9,000 of them having to do with transfusions. But that leaves 4,000 articles that have to do with something besides transfusions that have some relevance to blood type. And it turns out that there's a lot of physiology connected to blood type. There's a lot of expression of immunologic identity through blood type because it actually is part of how you parse the environment in some way that's unique to you. So I wrote Eat Right for Your Type, a, a widely misunderstood book um, by lots of people who were in the know and a tremendously enthusiastically received and enjoyed book by people who were looking for simple ways to get better. So there was the first discovery process, which is that if you write books that often wind up being useful to the general population but come at concepts that are at variance with the essential um, normal ways we look at medical information, uh, you wind up in situations where you can have a bit of consternation. And that book generates, to this day, a considerable amount of controversy. Not the, least of it, not the least of which is that people have their pet ideas about what food is supposed to be, and they have pet ideas about what good diets are supposed to be. So you have paleo diets, you have high protein diets, you have low fat diets, you have high fat diets, you have low carb diets. Uh, and then you have a book that says actually they're all right. Any one of them is a particularly good diet, and if you do some basic testing of individuality, they can be especially good in certain people. Which, of course, means that all the people with that pet diet are particularly peeved at you because now you've relegated them to a subsection of your diet, which basically doesn't make anybody happy, especially in the dog-eat-dog -dog world of diets. So if you have a person who predicates a theory that veganism is a way to save the planet, it's very good for everybody, strong argument to a certain degree, uh, but if their plan is to make everybody vegan, they'll see the recommendations for type O as being at variance with that makes for a lot of consternation. All the, all the low carb people see the type A diet and think, oh, I can't eat that, it's got too many carbs in it. So to a certain degree, I don't know if you're familiar with something called Fortianism, but it's a philosophy that says that reality lies in what Fort considered the excluded middle, the place where the extremes are, are sort of meet, reach a sort of a meeting point. And that's where I found that blood type was. It was the first of what you might call the personalized diets. And that's the way of the future, folks. You want to talk about genomics and nutrition? I don't think there are going to be too many other diets that are coming down the road that are not going to be able to, not going to be forced to factor it in. And there was the first diet that factored it in. Blood type's a big gene, you know. I won't, and this is not a lecture on blood type, by the way, but blood type is a big component in genotype, so you should be aware of this.